If you've been following current events, you may be familiar with the story of Ray Nagin, the former mayor of New Orleans. Sixteen years ago, he was running for the office of mayor in New Orleans on the ticket on the platform of cleaning up city government. He was a reform-minded businessman who wanted to come in and help clean up the city, particularly the government. So he's elected on that platform, and 16 years later, he finds himself walking out of a federal courtroom having been convicted of multiple counts of criminal corruption as the mayor in New Orleans. When you hear that story, you just, you've got to hear that story and think, something went wrong along the way. He had this incredible opportunity Something went wrong. Look where he ended up. He ended up with nothing. You've heard these stories in the media. The media seems to put these kinds of stories in front of us frequently because these kinds of stories are apparently happening frequently. Take Vince Young, uh, NFL quarterback. He came into the league, received a contract in 2006 for a $25 million guaranteed money contract. He signed again in 2011 for about $5 million, and over the course of his career, it has been said that he made somewhere around $34 million, and this last month, he filed for bankruptcy. And when you hear that story, you're going to think if something went wrong, and no, we don't know the story, we don't know the ins and the outs, but we certainly like listening to those stories and hearing those stories and having opinions about those individuals, don't we? And we just know that something went wrong. How can you go from there to here and end up with nothing when you had so much? A story in Second Chronicles we're going to look at today in chapter 28 could, could definitely be a story that our media picks up on, a guy who had everything and lost it all. And I just want to encourage you that when you hear this story this morning, that you really respond to it by, instead of having criticism towards the person in the story that lost everything, how could they do that? That's the dumbest thing. How could you be that silly? How could you make those decisions? Why didn't he ever do anything right? I mean, instead of being just critical about the person in the story, Perhaps we could all just ask the question, is there a lesson here for me? See, the story was recorded for us because God wanted us to learn something about us and about Him. It's not there just so we can hear the downfall and somehow feel better about our lives because we're not them. It's there for us to learn something about the Lord, learn something about us. And I just want to encourage you to come to this story with that perspective. All right, the, the setup for the story, the setting for the story of King Ahaz is he became king at 20 years old. We're going to read about that in St. Chronicles 28, just a second. But I want to remind you where he came from. His father's name was Jotham. If you remember from last week, if you were here, the story of Jotham's life is one that's filled with prosperity and success in expanding and secure kingdom. And he is this mighty king of Judah. And, and the scripture says that he became mighty because he ordered his life before the Lord. So he experienced this incredible prosperity, all these wonderful things in his rule over Judah because he ordered his entire life before God. And when he dies, he gives this kingdom that has become incredibly prosperous because he ordered his life before the Lord. He gives this kingdom to his son Ahaz. Now Ahaz has had two decades of watching his father order his life before the Lord and seeing the benefit and the blessing that came from God because his father did that. So he has everything in terms of the kingdom given to him. It's secure, it's safe, it's prosperous, everything is perfect. It's incredible. And that's what's given to him. And he had this example of a father who ordered his entire life before the Lord. And the testimony of the worth of that decision in the might of the kingdom that his father gave him. So, so he had everything. He had it all. And an example of how to continue to honor the Lord in his father. Pretty amazing. 
So let's see what Ahaz does with everything that he has been given. 2 Chronicles chapter 28, if you don't have your Bible, please pick up the pew Bible there in front of you and turn to about page 335 or so. You'll find 2 Chronicles chapter 28. We're going to read the whole chapter together and would love for everyone to read along in the text. All right, Chapter 28, verse 1. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he did not do right in the sight of the Lord as David, his father, had done. Now notice here the chronicler compares him back to David. There's a couple things going on there. Just a reminder that we're dealing with the line of David, and that's the line that's been given the promise that there would be a king sitting on the throne of God over Israel forever. It just brings that back into focus. And then it's just setting up this contrast between David and Ahaz. We, the, the chronicler wants us to see just how bad Ahaz is and he does it by first setting up a contrast with David. All right? So he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord as David his father had done. Verse 2, but he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. That's really bad. Remember, every time we see Israel, the chronicler is pointing out the fact that Israel is incredibly rebellious on the brink of complete annihilation because of the rebellion against God and God's judgment, which has fallen on Israel. And it says here of Ahaz that he's a lot like Israel. He also made molten images for the Baals. He's making idols. Verse 3, moreover, he burned incense in the valley of Ben-Hinnom and burned his sons in the fire. So he's burning his own kids as sacrifices to foreign gods, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had driven out before the sons of Israel. He sacrificed and burned incense on, every, on the high places, on the hills, and under every green tree. Ahaz has taken everything that was given to him, and the example that was lived out before him, and he has turned against the Lord, and he is pursuing unfaithfulness to a degree that we have not seen in Judah. Terrible. Terrible how he is turning away from the Lord. Now let's look at the Lord's response to what Ahaz is doing. Verse 5, Wherefore the Lord his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Aram, and they defeated him and carried away from him a great number of captives and brought them to Damascus. And he also was delivered into the hand of the king of Israel who inflicted him with heavy casualties. No, notice the, the way the author is stating these losses. He was delivered into their hand. He was delivered into... God is the one that's delivering him. He is ordaining this distress in Ahaz's life. Ahaz is unfaithful to what God has given him, to the example set before him. He turns away from the Lord, and the Lord then delivers into Ahaz's life incredible distress. He was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who inflicted him with heavy casualties. For Pekah, the son of Ramalia, slew in Judah 120,000 in one day, all valiant men, because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. And Zikri, a mighty man of Ephraim, slew Masiah, the king's son, and Azakrakam, the ruler of the house, and Elkanah, the second to the king. Ahaz is seeing guys close to him being taken out by the distress that he was delivered into by the Lord. You just got to wonder, is, is Ahaz paying attention at all to what God is doing? Now, within this story, we are presented a story uh, that is about Israel, which is very unusual. The chronicler has been focusing on Judah, and now we have a story within a story that focuses on this incident in Israel with Israelites. Okay, so we have the picture of, of Ahaz, who was given everything and turned away from the Lord, and God delivered him into great distress, such that there's no way any of us would ever think we'd be in that place. If God did this and we knew that it was God, would we not turn to God? And Ahaz is in this situation where we wonder, what is wrong with this guy? And then we get this story within a story about Israel. Remember, Israel's been portrayed to us as this incredible evil nation that is under the wrath of God and is on the brink of annihilation. Judah is the, 
the, the, the nation that God has given the promise to. Now we're going to see this contrast again between Judah and Israel with a story within a story. Okay, verse 8. The sons of Israel carried away captive of their brethren 200,000 women, sons, and daughters. And they took also a great deal of spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. But a prophet of the Lord was there whose name was Oded, and he went out to meet the army which came to Samaria and said to them, Behold, because of the Lord, the God of your fathers, was angry with Judah, he has delivered them into your hand, and you have slain them in a rage which has even reached heaven. Now you yourselves are proposing to subjugate for yourselves the people of Judah and Jerusalem for male and female slaves. Surely do you not have transgressions of your own against the Lord your God? Now, therefore, listen to me and return the captives whom you captured from your brothers, for the burning anger of the Lord is against you. Then some of the heads of the sons of Ephraim, a bunch of hard names, arose against those who were coming from the battle and said to them, you must not bring the captives in here, for you are proposing to bring upon us guilt against the Lord, adding to our sins and our guilt. For our guilt is great, so that his burning anger is against Israel. So the armed men left the captives and the spoil before the officers and all the assembly. Then the men who were designated by name arose, took the captives, and they clothed all their naked ones from the spoil, and they gave them clothes and sandals, fed them, gave them drink, anointed them with oil, led all their feeble ones on, on donkeys, and brought them to Jericho, the city of palm trees, so to their brothers, then they returned to Samaria. So here you have these people of Israel who have not been paying attention to God at all. A prophet of God shows up, says, look, don't do this. You're already in enough trouble. Don't add to it. Listen to the Lord. And what did they do? They listened to the Lord. This group had no reason to listen to the Lord. They were far removed from God. They had terrible examples to follow. And they listened to the Lord when God spoke. And here you have Ahaz, who had a father who followed the Lord, gave him everything in the kingdom. He's turned away from the Lord. The Lord's delivered him into distress. Unbelievable distress. So that the second command is wiped out. His son is wiped out. The ruler of the house is wiped out. And what does Ahaz do? He's not listening to the Lord. Even Israel can listen to the Lord and figure out that if we turn to the Lord, the Lord will respond to us. If we do not turn to the Lord and we continue in faithfulness, then his burning anger will be against us and he will deliver us into great distress. They get that. Ahaz doesn't get it. He doesn't care. Incredible how he's walking away from the Lord. Verse 16, at that time, King Ahaz sent to the kings of Assyria for help. At the same time that these people from, that were captured and taken to Israel come back home because the Israelites listened to God and were delivered. At the same time, Ahaz sees that experience and says, you know what? I'm going to turn to the gods of Damascus for help. Look what he does. He says, I'm going to turn to the king of Syria for help, for again the Edomites had come and attacked Judah, carried away captives. The Philistines had also invaded the cities of the lowland, of the Negev of, of Judah, and had taken Beth Shemesh, Ajalon, Gedaroth, and Sako with its villages, Timnah with its villages, and Gimzo with its villages, and they settled there. For the Lord humbled Judah because of Ahaz, king of Israel, for he brought about a lack of restraint in Judah and was very unfaithful to the Lord. And so the king of Assyria came against him and afflicted him instead of strengthening him, although Ahaz took a portion out of the house of the Lord and out of the palace of the king and of the princes and gave it to the king of Assyria. It did not help him. He goes, I'm going to go to the king of Assyria for help. Makes a deal with the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria turns on him and comes against him instead of helping him, even though he was paid to help. It says that he, he led Judah into a place of the lack of restraint. You know when else we've seen that in Scripture? Back in, in Numbers, when God's people rebelled against the Lord in, in Exodus. How they rebelled against the Lord and built the golden calf. And people were going crazy in worshiping false god, this golden calf, says there they had a lack of restraint. That's what he has created in Judah, that kind of mayhem and chaos where they're turning against the Lord in complete rebellion. And look what he does. Now the time, listen to verse 22. Now in the time of his distress, 
So he just keeps having more and more distress in his unfaithfulness. In the time of his distress, this same king Ahaz became yet more unfaithful to the Lord. Here's where he turns to the gods of Damascus. For he sacrificed to the gods of Damascus, which had defeated him, and said, because of the gods, the kings of Aram helped them. I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. But they became the downfall of him and all of Israel. Moreover, when Ahaz gathered together the utensils of the house of God, he cut the utensils of the house of God in pieces. He closed the doors of the house of the Lord, made altars for himself in every corner of Jerusalem, in every city of Judah, he made high places to burn incense to other gods, and provoked the Lord, the God of his fathers, to anger. Now the rest of his acts and all of his ways, from first to last, Behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. So Ahaz slept with his fathers. They buried him in the city in Jerusalem, for they did not bring him into the tomb of the kings of Israel. And Hezekiah, his son, reigned in his place. In his distress, he became even more unfaithful. And he nailed shut the doors of the temple, and he closed his heart to God. And he set up every abomination in the nation to worship every other God but the God who delivered Israel. And he died with nothing. And the message is clear that nothing good ever comes from unfaithfulness. And that's a truth that is as true today as it was in the day of Ahab. Reality is that every single one of us in this room know what it's like to walk into sin. To walk in unfaithfulness before the Lord. Every person here knows what that is like. Everyone in here has done something along the way in our lives to walk in sin and to walk in unfaithfulness. Some of us here know what it feels like to get angry at someone. To be so mad at them that you don't care about forgiving them. You just want them to be hurt. You become bitter. Some of us in here know exactly what it's like to tell a little white lie and see that, that small lie snowball into a huge mess. We know what that's like. We, we know what it's like to walk in sin and unfaithfulness. We know what it's like to, to hurt someone by saying something or doing something that we really didn't intend to hurt them, but it ended up hurting them and then we're in a mess and we don't know what to do. And we, we feel the consequences of those sins, those moments of unfaithfulness when we are mean and, and unkind. We do damage that we really didn't intend to do, but it came out of something that was wrong in our hearts. We, we know what that's like to walk in unfaithfulness. When you think about Ahaz's story, don't distance yourself so much from him just because you're not a king of a nation. We know what it's like to walk in Ahaz's shoes, choosing unfaithfulness over faithfulness to the Lord. Every one of us. And because of that, we also know what it's like to walk in the distress that comes as a result of unfaithfulness. I mean, we know the feeling of guilt and shame that comes when we walk into unfaithfulness, particularly when that unfaithfulness is embarrassing or something we wouldn't want others to know that we did. And we feel that shame and that guilt. We feel and experience the consequences of our sin, the bad decisions we've made that have hurt others and damaged relationships and ruined our reputation for a time. We, we feel the consequences of our sin. And we also know that there is distress that comes into our lives when we are unfaithful before the Lord that is ordained by God as a response to our unfaithfulness. The Bible in the New Testament calls that God's discipline. We, we see that throughout the Old Testament. We've seen it many times here in 2 Chronicles, how when the God's people are unfaithful, God brings distress in their lives. We hear it in the New Testament, how when followers of Christ are disobedient, unfaithful, that God brings discipline in their lives. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, we see a great verse that encourages us to recognize why does God bring distress in our lives when we are unfaithful? 
Well, because he wants us to be trained by the distress that comes into our lives through our unfaithfulness so we would reap instead of the fruit of unfaithfulness the fruit of the righteousness of Christ which we can receive through faith in Jesus. He wants us to move away from unfaithfulness to faith in Christ so we might avoid the consequences and the distress of further unfaithfulness because nothing good ever comes from unfaithfulness to the Lord. God's intent is that we turn to Him in our distress. That, that's why we have this contrast set up in 2 Chronicles chapter 28 with these people in Israel. They shouldn't have turned to the Lord in their distress, but they did. They listened to God. They turned to Him. That's what Ahaz is supposed to do. He never did. And the distress brought him to emptiness because of his continued unfaithfulness. God wants us to turn our hearts to Him when we are unfaithful and He brings distress into our lives. Now what I'm not saying this morning, li listen to this, what I'm not saying this morning is that every element of distress in your life is because of some area of unfaithfulness in your life. I, I don't want you to leave today and, and believe that Every area of unfaithfulness has a direct correlation to some area of distress in your life because God is reciprocating all your unfaithfulness with unbelievable distress. Because that's not the only reason that distress comes into your life. There are primarily three reasons that distress comes into your life. Reason number one, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Distress comes into our life in the form of persecution. We're living faithfully before the Lord and bad things happen to us because we live faithfully for the Lord. So There's a possibility that you have distress in your life as a follower of Jesus Christ because you're following Christ. That's one option. Option number two, Romans chapter 8, verse 21, talks about that the world that we live in is in slavery to corruption. In other words, we live in a broken world. And in this broken world, the brokenness of this world is going to lay out distress on its inhabitants. Because this world we live in is in slavery to corruption because of sinfulness. Because of the corruption and the brokenness of the world, we are going to have periodic moments and experiences of distress because we live here. So that's the second possible reason. And the third one is, when we are unfaithful to the Lord... God will bring distress in our lives. Now, when you're in unfaithfulness, when you're living in sin, and you know that you've rejected God, you're walking away from Him, and you've got a lot of distress in your lives, you don't have to really think a lot to figure out whether or not that is God-ordained distress. Because He's told us in His Word, if you rebel against me, I'm going to bring distress in your life because I want you to come back to me. And that's what He's going to do. So you know that's going to happen, but there are a lot of times in life when it's just not that clear. You don't know whether it's related to some sin that you've sinned last week, or whether it's related to the fact that you're trying to follow Christ in your life, or whether it's related to the fact that you're just living in a broken world. Sometimes it's just not that clear. And I just want to encourage you to recognize that no matter why distress comes into your life, it is always God-ordained, because God is in control of all things. So when distress comes into your life, it's not near as important to understand why it's in your life as it is to respond to the distress correctly. You see, when distress comes into our lives, God wants us to see that distress as an invitation to trust Him, to move away from any unfaithfulness in our life and move more towards turning to the Lord and trusting Him. That's why he puts distress in our lives. He is redeeming the brokenness of this world and the distress that it brings into our lives by saying, I'm going to use the very thing that is broken about this world and I'm going to redeem it. I'm going to use it in your life to turn you to me. And what God wants to do is he wants to use the distress we will all encounter throughout our life to turn to him. And here's the deal. Every single one of us in this room, for the rest of our lives, the lo the, as long as the Lord gives us breath on this earth, we will encounter distress. St students, college students in here, listen, 
You're not near as far along in life as many of us are, and I promise you, you will encounter great measures of distress through the rest of your life. And God wants you to know that He is redeeming that distress in your life by giving you opportunity in that distress, through that distress, to be encouraged to turn your hearts to the Lord. What you do not want to do is what Ahaz did. Chapter 28, verse 22 says that in Ahaz's distress, he became even more unfaithful to the Lord. That's the one thing God does not want for you. He does not want for you to find yourself in distress and respond to that distress with more unfaithfulness. He wants you to turn to Him. Have you ever seen people who find themselves in distress and they respond to that distress with more unfaithfulness to the Lord? Over the years in ministry, I've seen moms and dads lose children. And I've seen them become angry at God. I've seen a husband or a wife lose a spouse and become angry at God. I've seen children lose a parent and become angry at God. I've seen people lose jobs and become angry at God. I've seen people contract diseases and become angry at God. I've seen people have experience with friendship and brokenness and someone stabs them in the back and mistreats them and they become angry at God. I've seen people in the church hurt by the church and they become angry at God. I've seen it over and over again that in people's distress, they respond to that distress with even more unfaithfulness. And the message of this, this story is that you should not do that because nothing good ever comes from unfaithfulness. If you find your life in distress and you respond with more unfaithfulness, it's like saying to the Lord, I know you're my only hope. I know that you're, only, you're my only source of help in this distress, but I don't care. I don't want your help. And somehow you think you'll find relief in turning away from the Lord and you're angry at Him. And guess what? That does not work. You cannot find relief in unfaithfulness to the Lord. Nothing good ever comes from unfaithfulness. If you're here this morning and, and you found yourself in distress and, and you have responded to your distress with more unfaithfulness, I just want to encourage you. You will not find help in unfaithfulness. You will not find life in unfaithfulness. You will not find hope in unfaithfulness. See, the Lord wants us all, when we encounter distress, to respond to that distress by turning our hearts to Him. I'm the first one to admit that sometimes when you find yourself in distress and you turn your heart to the Lord, that you want the distress to actually stop. And sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it gets worse. And sometimes there's simply no answer. But I can tell you this. If you respond to any kind of distress with unfaithfulness, you will not find anything better. But if you respond to distress, no matter what happens in that response to the Lord, and you turn to the Lord, you will find hope. You will find joy. You will find a path to life. Regardless of whether or not you're in deep sin or whether you're trying to follow the Lord, when distress comes in your life, you know what? The response is the same. I want to turn to the Lord and I want to have a repentant heart. Maybe there is no gross sin that's led me in rebellion to turn my back on the Lord and run the other way, but you know what? I'm a lot closer to being Ahaz than what I think about myself many, many times. And it'd be a whole lot better for me than to think I'm not going to do what Ahaz did, to think I could very well be the next Ahaz. And in this distress, I want it to have its full effect by turning me more to the Lord than I ever could imagine. 
Sometimes people ask the Lord, why? Why are you letting this happen to me? Why is this happening? Why aren't you doing something? If you love me, if you care about me, why are you letting this go on in my life? Sometimes we don't get all the answers we want this side of heaven. In that side of heaven, all the answers we think we need, we're probably not going to need. But you know what God has said to us right now in response to that question? Why is this happening to me? Because I want you to trust me above all things. I want you to rely on me. And I'm taking what's coming at you in this world and I am creating a perfect scenario for you to turn your heart to me and find love and grace and peace and hope that perhaps no other place in life you could find it. Turn to me. Why am I ordaining distress? Because you need me. So many times I fear that we are so short-sighted. Something happens in a moment and it's distressful and we want out of the distress. I'm just like that. I don't like pain. I don't like sorrow. I don't like brokenness. I'm just like you. I want it to end. But God is less concerned about the short-sighted experience of our emotional life And he is more concerned about the long-term place of our soul. And he is taking the brokenness of this world. And he is redeeming it by creating an invitation to you and me in the distress to turn our hearts to him. I love this quote by Spurgeon. He says, trials cut the ropes which fashion our souls to earthly things. They file the chains which, as on the eagle's foot, will not let her spread her wings and soar upward toward the sun. Trouble like a sharp spade digs up the earth that is about our roots, and then we bring forth the more fruit. Were it not for the thorns in our nest, we should be so content with its soft lining that we should sit in it until we die. But the sharp thorns which prick our bodies and then We turn our eye aloft and learn to try our wings, ready for the time when they shall have fully grown and we shall fly to joys above. Don't don't be like Ahaz. And in your distress, become even more unfaithful to the Lord because nothing good ever comes from unfaithfulness. I don't know if you're like me, but this story about Ahaz is really personal. And I suspect it's very personal for a lot of you. I mean, don't a lot of you know a person who's lived out Ahaz's story? Certainly all of us have heard it. It's in the media every day. But I bet a lot of us know someone who's lived out Ahaz's story. For me, it was my mom. She responded to her distress with more unfaithfulness. She ended up empty. She tried to find relief in so many things, but none of those things involved turning to the Lord. I'm grateful that at the end of her life, she turned to the Lord, but what she did not know is that shortly after she turned to the Lord, the Lord would take her home. And she'd have no chance to live out life having turned to the Lord. I hope it's that personal for you. But what I hope you feel from the personal nature of this story is that you have a chance to not be Ahaz, if you're sitting here this morning and you're listening to God's word, your story doesn't have to be like Ahaz.
See, there's a bigger picture that the chronicler is wanting to get across to the people in the day of the chronicler. The king Ahaz failed miserably, but guess what? We're back in Jerusalem. We've rebuilt the temple. We've rebuilt the walls of the city. It doesn't matter how much unfaithfulness has occurred in the nation of Israel. God has remained faithful to his promise. And here we are, a people, a remnant, who is waiting again for the king. God has been faithful. And we need to trust him. Because he's going to send a king who will be our savior. There's a bigger picture involved. And it's the faithfulness of God. And the faithfulness of God has been lavished upon us in the person of Jesus Christ. So that everyone in here can respond to the distress of this life. Turning to Jesus Christ, the king of kings, the lord of lords. Who has promised he is coming again to make all wrongs right. Turn to the Lord. You know, most of us in here probably won't hold the office of mayor in any great city in America. And most of us in here will not have $34 million to squander. But let me ask you this. What's more valuable? $34 million? Or the opportunity to know and walk with Jesus Christ? We have it all. And when distress comes, let's turn to the one who's promised to deliver it all. Trust in the Lord.